Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to be taking a look at what appears to be a pretty generic old PC. But it is a computer with somewhat of an interesting backstory. Created by Mitech, a global Taiwanese PC manufacturer, nowadays rebranded as your go-to partner for realizing smart, sustainable, connected experiences in the area of cloud computing, edge computing, automotive electronics, and smart networks, products, and services. Quite the mouthful. But back to 1988, where there was no cloud, no smart networks, or no edge computing. We just had personal computers. Now, Mitech was doing pretty well, selling a variety of personal computers, IBM clones, ranging from 8088 to 286, 386, and beyond. But another little company called Atari was also making waves in the PC space down in Europe. I believe over two-thirds of all Atari PC sales were taking place here in Europe. Now, Atari had a couple of PC lineups, and in 1988, they were busy developing and manufacturing the Atari PC4, a 286-based system. However, due to delays and Atari wanting to push their PC4 offering as soon as possible, they went into business with Mitech, an OEM, and rebranded the Mitech Paragon 286VE, as you are seeing here, as an Atari PC4. They just slapped on an Atari badge and that was it. The Atari PC4 was born. So yeah, you can consider this Mitech 286 as kind of a stopgap product for Atari, allowing them to market and sell the PC4 before finally designing their own PC4 with their own motherboard, own case. Now, if you're interested in Atari stuff, whether it's, you know, home computers or PCs, then definitely check out Atari Legend. A fellow countryman from Belgium here has an awesome YouTube channel covering uh, lots of stuff related to Atari. And he also has this video on the Atari PC4, the PC offering from Atari that I was talking about here. So yeah, definitely check out his channel. He has lots of cool content related to Atari. I'll put a link into the description and I'll try to put a card up here. So definitely check him out. And so here we are with the MeTech 286, the Paragon 286V. Now this does have a Maxcom 286 badge here, but Maxcom is just a shop that was selling these PCs. It was a PC shop in Brussels. It features a standard power supply. It has some I.O. built in like a printer port. It has two serial ports. It has an analog video port, a VGA port, has some dip switches to display various video modes and has this mysterious on off switch or hole. Now on the back, we also see some expansion cards and we see a digital video port here, which is a nine pin D sub connector, probably for MDA or CGA or EGA. We also have the model badge here, which is the MPC 2000 V an internal product number because most of the people knew this PC as the Paragon 286 V. Now another interesting note of this PC is the fact that it lacks a keyboard connector here on the back. And for that, we need to go to the front where there is a keyboard connector here at the front bottom of the PC. We also have two gaping holes here for two five and a quarter inch uh, drives and one three and a half inch drive. So this PC would have been equipped with a five and a quarter inch floppy drive in one of the five and a quarter inch drive bays and a three and a half inch disc drive in the three and a half inch drive bay. Now, as a serious retro collector, I do pride myself in having a whole bunch of accessories, including a five and a quarter inch disc drive and three and a half inch disc drive that goes very well with this yellowed case. Now, Mitech was branding this as a small footprint computer, and it is pretty small, and it does offer sufficient upgrade uh, capabilities. It has sufficient drive base for five and a quarter inch drives and three and a half inch drives, both internal and external. On the front, it features a key lock, a power on off switch, a reset button, a 12 megahertz speed indicator indicating some kind of turbo functionality, a hard drive LED and a power LED. 
Like I said, keyboard connector is here at the front bottom. So let's open up the machine now to see how she looks inside. And man, were we up for a surprise here because the first thing you notice is that big gunk of battery leakage here on the chassis that obviously has also made its way onto the motherboard, unfortunately. See how this whole area here on the motherboard is affected battery. So yeah, this is not looking good. And yeah, for obvious reasons, the computer doesn't start in this condition. We don't hear any power supply fan. It was only when I disconnected the two power cables from the power supply to go into the motherboard that I heard the power supply uh, fan spinning. So I guess the power supply is okay, but it shouldn't come as a shock that the computer won't start properly. So yeah, also notice the orientation here of the two power connectors. So normally these sit side by side and you make sure that the black leads are sitting adjacent to each other. But on this motherboard configuration, they've decided to put them uh, alongside each other. So yeah, a little bit different. Now I did want to see if there were any obvious uh, dead shorts on the... Uh, motherboard but I couldn't find any not on this uh, Molex connector where you can see the 5 volts and the 12 volts um, on none of them there was a dead short I also checked the minus 5 and the minus 12 volts on the uh, AT power supply and also there I couldn't find a short so something else was was causing the fact that the power supply didn't start with this motherboard so the power supply does output a clean 5 and 12 volts when not attached to the motherboard. So yeah, let's take a look at it. And it wasn't uh, held into place with uh, screws. So yeah, first task at hand is just to remove every connector here. Here we have digital video connector, which is just, you know, a connector on the motherboard. Here we have the keyboard connector. I'm going to remove this drive bay here so that I have a little bit more access to the motherboard. So yeah, just a standard four pin uh, cable here for the AT style keyboard. I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. And then we also have some other connectors like the ones for the PC speaker, the power LED, the turbo switch, the reset button. So we're gonna go ahead and remove those. And then we should be able to slide the motherboard right on out of the case as like I said, it wasn't attached at all. So somebody definitely already you know, tried to do some work on it. And yeah, I mean, this just uh, speaks for itself. I think uh, severe uh, battery leakage here on the right hand side. I mean, not the entire motherboard is affected, but you know, pretty large uh, surface area. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, at this point, I was pretty sure that the motherboard would be completely dead, that traces would have been eaten away completely and that certain chips would be gone forever. But yeah, I still wanted to give it a go because I think the computer is unique enough to give it a shot. I can imagine that, you know, in a lot of these cases, it looks far worse than it really is. But we'll only know for sure once we start cleaning it. Now, what we do know is that this computer has a 286 CPU running at 12 megahertz, which is hidden away behind this little heatsink here. And unfortunately, I have no idea how to remove this heatsink because it is pretty firmly attached to this little plastic cover here. And I just can't seem to slide it on upwards, which I think is the appropriate way to get it out because it's kind of trapped in between these plastics here. I guess you need to push it on upwards here so that it gets released on one side and then you can just tip it over. The computer also came with four sticks of RAM and it's not your traditional 30 pin SIM modules that we find here, but these are SIP modules. SIP standing for a single inline pin package as opposed to SIM, which stands for single inline memory module. Now these SIP modules were kind of a short lived variant of those 30 pin SIM modules. It 
basically consisted of these 30 pins that needed to match uh, holes into the motherboard so there was no real connector there it was kind of awkward to push them in and pull them out so again they were very short-lived thank god as i can imagine that these were very error prone for uh, failure as you try to insert them or remove them from the motherboard there are actually converters where you can attach kind of SIP to SIM uh, uh, converter connectors onto the motherboard. So that would allow you to insert standard SIM modules onto this motherboard. So these were both pin compatible. Now, before I start cleaning the motherboard, I'm also going to be removing all of the socketed chips like these BIOS chips here, but there are other chips which are socketed on this motherboard. So it's always best to remove them so that you will be able to dry the motherboard a lot uh, quicker and, and more easy. So I'm just gonna be removing all of them. Some of them were a bit too big for the tool that I had at hand. So I'm just gonna be using a flathead screwdriver here to gently push them right on out. So yeah, as you can see, some of the pins on these chips are also a bit dirty. So they definitely also need a bit of a cleaning. So yeah. And as you can see here, just beneath that socket, you have this kind of oily trace that you also see on the back of the chip here. So not really sure if this was also caused by the battery leakage. I'm guessing it is, but yeah, we'll definitely be cleaning all of that uh, properly. I'm also going to be removing all of the jumpers on this motherboard. It's best to take uh, pictures or have some kind of manual of the motherboard, obviously, before you do that. But it also just helps up with, uh, you know, the drying process. The, the fewer uh, components that you have attached here on the PCB, the, the faster it will actually dry. And yeah, so focus point here will be this area here because I wasn't able to remove the CPU. I didn't want to submerge the thing completely into water. So I'm just going to be focusing on this area here and start by using some soapy water just to see how far that will get me in terms of getting all of this gunk here from the from the PCB and, and have kind of a C on, on how big the damage actually is. If there are indeed broken pins, if there are traces that have been completely eaten away so yeah off to the kitchen where we will run some water and yeah just take into account that the cpu is still there and i don't really want to submerge that part so yeah i'm just going to take a glass of that soapy water here and start with that so i'm just going to spill it over this area here and then just use a toothbrush to start cleaning everything going to do that in you know multiple shots because uh, it was pretty dirty but so with uh, soapy water I could actually see that a lot of the kind of superficial uh, battery corrosion got off pretty easily but you do need several scrubbings here just to get everything everything out so yeah this is a first cleaning just to see how far this will get me and if I will be able to to get the computer to post and see where we can take it from there. I'm not gonna be using any vinegar at this point. I just want to use the soapy water to begin with. I just wanna dry the board because, you know, when the board is wet like this, it's going to be looking super clean, but it's only when stuff is drying up again that you will see the dirt which is left behind on the motherboard. But all in all, I mean, the area cleaned up pretty nicely just with the soapy water. So this is the board after, um, cleaning it so it definitely needs to dry out so i'm just going to be leaving it uh, here for a couple of hours perhaps use a hair dryer to get most of the water out but as you can see here there's still some residue on the pcb but i don't think that any traces got broken i think the components look all in all in pretty good shape so yeah i was getting uh, getting kind of hopeful to see if we would be able to to get this up and running again so yeah, definitely needs another uh, cleaning and I'm probably going to be using some vinegar here now just to see if I can get some of that corrosion uh, off there instead of just using soapy water or isopropyl alcohol. 
the vinegar which contains about seven percent acidity does a good job of neutralizing that you know uh, battery chemical uh, stuff that got uh, onto the motherboard which is not battery acid it's actually not acid at all it kind of registers as a base on the ph scale so you basically use the acidity of the the vinegar to kind of neutralize that effect and before i'm going to leave the motherboard to dry i'm just going to use some isopropyl alcohol here on the area that i used to clean just to make sure that we give it an additional scrub the isopropyl alcohol will um, basically help with the cleaning process and it will also you know pick up some uh, additional residue it will evaporate pretty quickly and while we let the motherboard dry we can take a look at the various chips that we pulled from the motherboard because those also need a bit of a cleaning i mean just look at the the bottom of this chip here it is pretty dirty and also some of the other ones also the pins aren't in the best of shape so we're just going to go ahead and use some isopropyl alcohol to clean everything luckily everything was properly labeled uh, both on the chips as well as on the silk screen of the motherboard so putting them back won't be that much of an issue but yeah for example this chip here also on the pins especially on this side uh, are pretty pretty messed up same with this one here which is a floppy drive controller um, one side took a bit of a beating the the sip modules the ram sticks also got hit a bit so we're going to be cleaning that off and then yeah hopefully once everything is cleaned up everything is dried out hopefully we can attempt to start the motherboard So, moment of truth. Let's see if it will start. Power supply is spinning. Monitor turns on. And we see a post message here. So, we see the Phoenix ROM BIOS here. There is a keyboard failure because I forgot to hook up the keyboard. It measures 640 kilobytes of base memory, zero extended memory. So, we probably need to configure that. The disk subsystem reset failed. But yeah, time to get that keyboard connector out of the case here so that we can finally attach a keyboard to the motherboard. So I'm just going to be hooking up this little cable and connector to the motherboard and hook up a standard AT style keyboard. So yeah, as a computer was booting, we got the 640K of base memory, but no extended memory. So as we enter the BIOS, we can go into the memory configuration. And as you can see, we have uh, bank zero and one set to 256 kilobytes, bank two and three set to none, because the last four uh, sockets uh, don't contain any memory. So this gives us, or this makes the BIOS believe that we have one megabyte of memory, but that's because bank zero and one is not properly configured. Because we have one megabyte sticks, we need to set this to one megabit times nine. This will allow the setup utility to see our four sticks of RAM as being four megabytes because you can already see in the extended memory we now have 3072K but we get this memory parity interrupt in the BIOS itself. Now after a reboot what we see is that we have 640K of base memory but it now counts all the way up to 3072K of extended memory giving us a total of four megabytes of RAM in total. And when we enter the setup utility, we still get a configuration error, but at least it sees the four megabytes of RAM. We have some other options regarding EMS that we're not going to go into right now, but here we see the total memory, 4,096 kilobytes. We can configure the floppy disks here. We have a predefined list of hard disk types. Uh, we can configure the video card. We can configure the CPU speed. So this is set to 12 megahertz. We don't have a math co-pro. 
So yeah, everything seemed to be fine, except for the fact that on subsequent reboots, the system would again only detect 512K of base memory, no extended memory, the system would hang, I couldn't even enter the setup menu anymore. So it was kind of acting up. I got these memory parity failure errors when I tried to use different sticks of RAM. Um, because I don't have a whole lot of SIP modules lying around and with my second set that I tried I couldn't get any further than this it constantly was throwing these uh, memory parity errors but even with the original sticks the system was acting up I just couldn't get it stable I have the impression that I could only get it stable when the system hadn't been turned on for a long time and it was actually you know pretty cold but other than that I mean it would just start acting up uh, when it was running for about five minutes or so. So yeah, here you can see the system booting and as it tries to test the extended memory, we get these memory write read failures and we just get a whole bunch of crap on the screen. I did try to spot if there were some components which were kind of heating up, uh, but I couldn't find any except for the CPU, which, which gets, you know, normally hot, but none of the other components seemed to be extremely hot. So yeah, this is where we're at at the moment. I mean, the motherboard does post from time to time. When it's a really cold start, I can go into the BIOS, set the memory settings correctly, and then it will do a count of four megabytes of RAM. But then a couple of minutes into the, into the cycle, it just becomes very unstable. So yeah, all in all, some mixed feelings about this MeTac 286 computer. I hope I will be able to fix the issues at hand. I think the PC is unique enough to give it some time and effort. So yeah, hopefully in part two of this video, you will see this computer starting with a disk drive and a hard drive attached, hopefully in a better state than it is today. We made some progress, but we're definitely not there yet. So. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider liking it, commenting on the video, and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already done so. And I hope to see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.